In the shadows of the Christian Middle Ages, there's a mystery that still baffles many minds today, the sacred relic. These pieces, considered divine, represent the connection between the physical and spiritual worlds in an era when religion was the center of everything. The truth about these relics, however, has always been shrouded in mystery. But that's not the end of the story. With the advancement of technology, scientists have started to dig deeper into these objects. Using modern methods, they've managed to shed new light on these antiquities, revealing secrets that have been kept for centuries. The main question is, are these relics really what they claim to be, or are they just products of faith mixed with invention? Even the Catholic Church has debated this a lot. Carbon tests have indicated that some of these relics might be much newer than previously thought, dating from 800 to 1,000 years after Christ, which raises doubts about their authenticity. However, new data has emerged, bringing evidence that could prove the true origin of these pieces. Interestingly, one of the researchers who worked on the initial analyses recently admitted that there were errors in the methodology, which really calls the accuracy of the results into question. On top of that, the full data from these studies has been kept from the public eye for almost 30 years. There are rumors that the labs responsible received financial incentives, which might have influenced the maintenance of the theory that the Shroud of Turin is a medieval creation. This raises suspicions about the possible interest of certain authorities in keeping secrets about the Shroud, which has been carefully preserved and displayed in a chapel since 1578. The Shroud is impressive in its dimensions, measuring 4.3 meters in length and 1.1 meters in width. What grabs the most attention are the faint brownish images on its surface, showing what seems to be the figure of an average height man, about 1.7 meters tall, with deeply marked eyes. On the screen, one half displayed the image of a reclining body, while the other half, elegantly folded, covered from the face to the feet, as if witnessing the last moments of a life. Some say that the marks on the shroud bear an uncanny resemblance to the wounds of Jesus Christ on the cross. In the head area, you can notice marks that seem to come from thorns, almost as if a crown of thorns had been painfully placed there. The signs on the shoulders suggest the weight of a heavy burden, while the wounds on the back appear to tell the story of a severe whipping. The stains scattered across the fabric, which many believe to be blood, deeply move those who see them, often regarded as the record of the ultimate sacrifice for humanity. It's important to remember that the Catholic Church does not officially confirm the authenticity of the relics. They are viewed as symbols of Christian devotion. However, it acknowledges that the Shroud is a powerful representation of the mystery of Christ's passion and death, venerated by millions of faithful. Since the late 19th century, researchers have been using science to explore the enigmas of the Shroud and try to verify its true origin. In 1898, scientists discovered something impressive about the Shroud of Turin. The images on it looked more like photographic negatives than regular photos. Nearly a century later, in 1988, the Catholic Church decided to investigate the Shroud's authenticity. To do this, they distributed small pieces of the fabric, about the size of a postage stamp, to three different laboratories for carbon-14 dating tests. The results were surprising. All the laboratories independently concluded that the fabric was created between 1260 and 1390, long after the time of Christ. Despite this, scientists still can't explain how the image was formed on the fabric. It shows a photographic negative of a body with wounds similar to those Christ would have suffered. Even though they are certain that the shroud is medieval and not from Christ's time, experts still don't fully understand its significance. For nearly a century, the shroud has been the subject of intense study. Even with today's advanced technology, no one has been able to reproduce the enigmatic image it presents. Advances in science are gradually bringing new evidence that strengthens the possibility that the Shroud of Turin is authentic. Barry Schwartz, who was part of the original investigation team and the project's photographer, initially had doubts about the work. Despite being a non-practicing Jew, he wondered if the Shroud was just a very well-made piece of art. However, upon closer examination, Barry encountered an enigma that still intrigues many scholars today. He mentioned the use of a special X-ray technique that enhances the contrast of the images based on density. 
allowing for a more detailed and vertical view of what is represented on the fabric. The Shroud of Turin has a fascinating peculiarity. It shows a human figure in three dimensions. This suggests that the intensity of the image is directly linked to the distance between the body and the fabric. This unique phenomenon leads to the conclusion that it is not just an artistic projection, as a conventional artwork or photograph wouldn't capture so many details. Researchers initially investigated the presence of pigments or substances that might indicate the image was fabricated. However, they found nothing to support this theory. Instead, they discovered that the image was formed by fibers that turned yellowish, arranged in a way that gives different shades of darkness in specific areas of the fabric, which is not typical of a painting. The credibility of the shroud took a hit when a radiocarbon test, conducted 10 years after the initial study, indicated that it wasn't as old as previously thought. Barry also points out an irregularity in the process. It took 27 years to access the original test data, managed by a British museum and released under the Freedom of Information Act. This delay in releasing scientific data is quite unusual and raises suspicions about the process. In the scientific world, it's common for researchers to publish their findings in journals and share their data so others can verify or expand on what was discovered. When they finally accessed the original data from a study, it revealed why there was hesitation in making it public. The data showed that the sample taken from the shroud was inconsistent, with dating varying from one end to the other by hundreds of years. This made it impossible to link a specific date to any part of the fabric. Additionally, the researchers didn't collect control samples, which are essential for ensuring accurate radiocarbon dating in other areas of the shroud. It was also noted that there was cotton interwoven in one corner of the sample. This goes against Jewish religious norms that prohibit mixing materials like cotton and linen. Typically, high-quality shrouds are made exclusively of linen, so the presence of cotton indicates that the shroud might have been repaired at that point. This repaired part was the one that underwent radiocarbon testing, which unfortunately compromised the accuracy of dating the rest of the fabric. Questions arose about whether the investigation of the shroud was truly impartial when it leaked that it had been dated as medieval even before the official results were released. To add to the controversy, an anonymous donor contributed one million British pounds to the British Museum specifically to discredit the shroud's authenticity. This money went to the Oxford Lab, one of the three that analyzed the fabric. It makes us wonder, are powerful groups trying to influence public perception about the shroud? Moreover, chemical analyses of what were thought to be bloodstains on the fabric were also conducted to verify their authenticity. They found that the stains were of blood type AB, which is rare in the general population, but more common among Jews. The blood still had a surprisingly bright red color which seemed to defy the idea that it was ancient, suggesting the terrible suffering of the person wrapped in the shroud. The stains on the arms indicated a brutal crucifixion, as they were exactly in the position where blood would flow during such an event. The analysis of the Shroud of Turin has led to some intriguing discoveries. First, it was noted that the blood stains appeared on the cloth before any image formed suggesting that the blood was deposited in a specific event about 72 hours before the image began to form. Analysis of the fabric revealed more surprises. Traces of limestone typical of Jerusalem were found in the shroud's dirt, similar to those found in tombs that, according to tradition, would be like those of Jesus. Another fascinating detail is the presence of 49 different types of pollen on the fabric, with 33 of these specific to the Palestine region and three unique to Jerusalem. This might even suggest a connection to the crown of thorns mentioned in biblical accounts. The technique used for these analyses, wide-angle X-ray scattering, allowed researchers to gain deep insights into the fabric's composition and its potential history. Scholars investigating the Shroud of Turin found fascinating details in the eyes of the figure depicted. Small traces of first-century coins, similar to those used in Jewish tombs during the time of Pontius Pilate. This adds another intriguing element to the Shroud's mystery. Additionally, the dimensions of the fabric, specifically 2 by 8 cubits, exactly match an ancient measurement used at the time, which is quite curious. 
Another notable detail is a 3-inch wide strip of fabric along one of the edges, sewn with a stitching style specific to 1st century Palestine. This sewing technique directly connects the shroud to that period and location. There are also aspects of the image on the shroud that correspond to biblical descriptions and archaeological findings, such as nails not in the hands but in the wrists, a fact corroborated by recent archaeological evidence and visible on the shroud. The marks on the head resemble thorn wounds, echoing the narrative of the crown of thorns. Additionally, the bruising on the shoulders suggests that the person stumbled and fell while carrying something heavy and bulky, likely a cross over uneven ground. Injuries on the nose, possibly from a fall or blows, add a layer of realism to the story told by the shroud. It's important not to overlook the wound on the side, which appears as an oval-shaped injury about two inches wide, similar to a Roman spear wound. The way the blood and serum separate and become visible on the shroud is something typically seen only after death from such an injury. This characteristic closely matches the description in the Gospel of John, adding even more mystery to the shroud. These details together form a powerful image of a man, telling the extraordinary story of the life of Jesus Christ. Additionally, scholars have found mysterious inscriptions on the fabric, which are still being studied and interpreted. These findings are truly impressive. In the study of the Shroud of Turin, an intriguing detail is the almost invisible inscriptions discovered next to and below the chin. These marks were analyzed by Barbara Frill, who used a very interesting technique. She cut photographs of the shroud into many small pieces to examine their optical properties, with the help of advanced technology. Then, using computer-enhanced images, she managed to identify words in Aramaic, Greek, and Latin scattered across the fabric. Barbara found that these inscriptions include the Greek name for Jesus of Nazareth. This discovery is crucial because it suggests that the shroud is much older than many think, not a medieval creation. Back then, no one would use Jesus' name in this way without associating it with his divinity, as it could be seen as heretical. She also enlarged these images and showed them to other experts, who confirmed that the style of the writings indeed seems to be from the first century, the time when Jesus lived. This strengthens the authenticity of the Shroud of Turin and the importance of these inscriptions for history. So the question that needs to be solved is how the image originally appeared on the fabric. Various theories have been suggested to try to unravel this mystery, which has become a significant point in the scientific analyses of the Shroud. In 2002, Raymond Rogers from the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico presented an explanation based on a simple chemical process he suggested that even a slight heat, around 40 degrees Celsius, or 104 degrees Fahrenheit, a temperature a body could briefly reach due to hypothermia or dehydration, could discolor the sugar molecules present in the cotton fibers. Rogers pointed out that no miraculous event was necessary for this to happen, although that idea was popular and comforting to some, since there was a lack of data supporting such a supposition. After all, Finding these images on burial shrouds is not a common occurrence. Another theory proposes that the discoloration of the fibers could result from a chemical reaction with some substance released by the body. The French biologist Paul Vigon suggested in the early 1900s that this substance could be ammonia, produced by the decomposition of urea in sweat. However, this explanation seems unsatisfactory, because the resulting image would be too blurry. In 1982, John Dal Salvo, a biophysicist, presented an interesting theory. He suggested that the dark material found in certain fabrics could be lactic acid from sweat. According to him, when chemicals released by plants come into contact with the fibers of a fabric, they form dark images similar to what happens when you leave leaves inside a book for a long time. On the other hand, John Jackson, another researcher, believes that the most likely explanation for the phenomenon is vacuum ultraviolet radiation. According to him, for the linen to become photosensitive and form the image, a special light is needed, but without the heat that usually accompanies this type of radiation. Jackson explains that it would require an absurd amount of light energy, much more than we know today, to create such an image. Additionally, if heat were involved, the fabric would disintegrate in seconds. He concludes that the only plausible explanation for such a phenomenon 
would be something like a miracle, given the volume of energy required, which would surpass all the electricity produced on the planet. The Shroud of Turin is considered by many believers to be something very special, representing the great suffering and sacrifice of Jesus. However, not everyone agrees. Some see the Shroud as a fraud. For many, though, it is a powerful symbol of faith that inspires and moves people around the world. Additionally, there is a belief that when Jesus returns, he will bring with him the Ark of the Covenant, an ancient relic that many believe is a symbol of God's presence. According to traditions, the return of Jesus with this sacred relic would be a path to salvation. But to understand this fully, it's important to know more about the history of the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant has been a cause of conflict in the past. In the Battle of Ebenezer, after a painful defeat, the leaders of Israel brought the Ark to the battlefield hoping for divine intervention against the Philistines. Unfortunately, they suffered an even greater defeat and lost 30,000 men. Additionally, Hophni and Phinehas died, and the Ark was captured by the Philistines. When a messenger arrived in Shiloh with this tragic news, dressed in torn clothes and covered in dust, the old priest Eli, upon hearing what had happened, died of grief. When Eli's daughter-in-law, who was pregnant, heard about the loss of the Ark, she named her son Ichabod, which means the glory of Israel has departed reflecting the devastating blow that the capture of the Ark represented for the people. Sadly, she also passed away shortly after. Meanwhile, the Philistines who had captured the Ark faced problems wherever they took it. In the Temple of Dagon in the city of Ashdod, they placed the Ark, and the next day the statue of the god Dagon was found fallen and broken. The situation in Ashdod quickly worsened, with the residents suffering from tumors and an invasion of rodents, suggesting they might have been dealing with the bubonic plague. The cities of Gath and Ekron, which also received the Ark, experienced similar disasters. After seven months following the advice of their priests, the Philistines decided to return the Ark to the Israelites. They even sent a tribute along with it, including golden figures of the tumors and rats that had afflicted them. When the Ark arrived in Beth Shemesh, the local people offered sacrifices and burnt offerings in thanks. They placed the Ark in the field of Joshua, and many came to look at the Ark out of curiosity. However, for disrespecting certain rules by looking directly at it, 70 of them were struck down as divine punishment. After this incident, the Ark was taken to the house of Abinadab, where it was kept under more respectful care. After some issues in Beth Shemesh, the residents asked the people of Kiriath Jerim, also known as Bala, to take the Ark. Eleazar, the son of the priest, was appointed to take care of it. For twenty years, the Ark remained in Kiriath Jerim. The Ark was also with Saul's army in battles against the Philistines. But Saul, anxious, often went to war without seeking guidance through it. According to the Book of One Chronicles, during Saul's reign, the people rarely sought the Ark for guidance. The Ark's significance was immense, representing the presence of God. Before Jesus was crucified, it was believed that the Holy Spirit did not dwell directly in the hearts of believers as it does today. Now Christians have direct access to God at any time, something that wasn't possible for the Israelites back then. The Ark of the Covenant symbolized the Divine Presence, as mentioned in various parts of the Bible. For example, in the Book of Joshua, to enter the Promised Land, the Israelites had to cross the Jordan River following the priests who carried the Ark. Joshua asked the people to purify themselves because God would perform wonders the next day. So that you may know that I am with you as I was with Moses, said the Lord. The next day, as described in the book of Joshua chapter 3, the river stopped flowing so the Israelites could cross. When the priests carrying the Ark entered the river, the waters parted, creating a dry path so they could cross safely. The Ark, symbolizing God's presence, was essential in ensuring their safe passage. The Ark played a crucial role again in Joshua 6, during the battle against Jericho. The city was heavily fortified, but following divine orders, after six days of marching around the city, the walls collapsed with a unified shout from the army on the seventh day, allowing the city to be conquered. The final verses of the chapter describe how God's presence was with Joshua boosting his reputation throughout the region. This series of events shows the power of the Ark as a symbol of divine influence. 
In 1 Samuel chapter 4, the importance of the ark is highlighted again when the Israelites, facing defeats against the Philistines, turn to the ark for military support. Despite their fear of the divine presence associated with the ark, the Philistines managed to capture it after winning the battle. The story goes that the Philistines placed the Ark of the Covenant next to one of their idols, but the idol kept falling over, as if it couldn't stand in the presence of the Ark. This showed that the divine presence in the Ark was stronger. Because of this, the Philistines tried to get rid of the problem by moving the Ark to various different cities, but the same kind of disaster struck each one. After seven months of facing these problems, they realized the best thing to do was to return the Ark to the Israelites. This episode shows just how sacred and powerful the Ark was considered to be. In the vision described in the Book of Revelation, some pretty intense images are painted. A massive earthquake shakes the earth, the sun and moon turn dark, and stars fall from the sky. Even the very structure of the heavens seems to collapse. Faced with such cataclysms, everyone, from kings to servants, tries to find places to hide, even asking for the mountains to fall on them and hide them from divine wrath. This is a warning that no matter how prepared someone thinks they are with food supplies, secure shelters, and weapons, none of it will be enough when the time of final judgment comes. Imagine the world changing drastically, earthquakes, mountains, and islands shifting, and even stars falling from the sky. In this scenario, everyone from kings to common folks feels a deep fear because it's the time of final judgment. In that moment, the material things we've accumulated won't matter. What truly matters is being spiritually prepared, because we don't know when that day will come. Paul, in a letter to the Thessalonians, warns us that the day of judgment will be sudden and unexpected, like a thief coming without warning. He compares it to the labor pains of a woman which are intense and unavoidable. He emphasizes that more than seeking material security or superficial peace, we should focus on strengthening our relationship with God, living righteously and faithfully following His teachings.